Our budget laws are evolving slowly, but thanks to Mang Lili and her tireless efforts on citizens' participation, they are moving slowly but surely towards participation. I remember when we started 2004. What's important when you participate in the budget is that you understand Tigasanga. Marunong ba ba si Buano? Marunong ba ba Tauso? See? You must understand the language. And the budgeting language uses so much technical terms. So much so that even if it is made available to all of us, and it is, you go to DBM, I don't know, is it the website already? Wala pa. Have you seen the budget? You know how thick it is? It's thick. Let me give it to you. You open it, magbasa ka, at magtiis ka. Sa pagkatang hirap, intindihin. I remember when I was a congressman, 2004, 2005, Hello Garcia came. We started the impeachment as opposition ako eh. So we started the impeachment. And one of the consequences of going for the impeachment in removing the person in the office of the president was that Malahan Yang would not release your, hello, with your PIDA. Have you heard of PIDA? CDM? Oink oink? Pork barrel? Yeah. So I had no pork barrel. When the others that voted against the impeachment, they pork barrel, they had projects galore. I had zero. Galit na galit na. Well, I was so mad. I called up BBM. This is Congressman Ligora. I would like to know why I do not have my CDF. And the guy at the other night said, Oh yes, Congressman. It was budget and it was budgeted and therefore appropriated. And then it was allocated, that's why nasaruhan. Pero hindi na release kaya walang NCA. Kaya na yung pound tapos na yung savings, kaya hindi na namin alam. <laughs> and I go, uh, why did you say so? Then I put down the phone because I don't know to understand. And that's the very point of it also. That in order for you to participate, the language of the budget has to be changed. Changed into something that all of us can understand. For example, example, I would say, as a businessman, I would say, a salo is a check voucher. And the NCA, NCA by the way means no piece of cash allocation, the NCA. Salo is your cash voucher, NCA is your check. Ah, businessmen, most people after college will understand that. But not about high school students. Because what we want the minimum reading is for citizens' participation, meaningful participation that everybody can understand the language. Down to the point, and this is our goal, where high school students can download the budget in the website and use the budget for their term papers in their social studies. So, Saro, 
is check voucher. NCA is your check. But wait a minute, do high school students understand the check and check voucher? I don't think so. And yung high school ako, I mean, hindi na ako nag-rabot ng parents ko yung bago ko for the week, di ba? So maybe we can make it like this. Saro is your ATM card. Oy, mukhang maintindihan yun, ano? Tapos, yung NCA, yun ang pagkinamit yung ATM at lumabas yung cash. Yun, maintindihan na, pwede na. So yun, that's just an example of the challenges we face. It's not that simple to say we will participate in the budget. Because, as we have been shown, we must understand, and we can only understand if there is capacity building. That's why Social Watch is so heavy into capacity building. The other point I would like to make is that there are four phases in budgeting. One, preparation. Two, authorization. Three, execution. And four, accountability. Preparation, more or less self-explanatory. The Central Bank, the DBM, and some other agencies, they prepare the budget kasama ng Department of Finance. Because the Department of Finance tells you where the money is coming from. Taxes, diba? That and all. That's one. And then authorization. Why? Because the budget is a law. And who authorizes? We guys. The ones who are in Congress. We who make laws. We enact laws. We're the ones. Why is it called authorization? Because we, we get the budget. This is the budget. Okay? So much for education, so much for medicine, for health, so much for the military. Mr. President, why not? This is the budget. You are hereby authorized to spend it this way. Because the Constitution says public money cannot be spent without a purpose. And that purpose is stated in the budget. And it should be authorized. In a corporation, policy making is in the board of directors. Then on the national policy is made by the people. The people? The Congress. Because we have what we call representative democracy. Whereby the people elect their representatives in Congress. And Congress is the one that makes policy. That's why you call Congress the House of Representatives. Of course, sir, we've been called a lot of other things, but never mind that. Let's stick to the House of Representatives. So, we authorize the executive branch to use the money this way. So much for education, so much for medicine, so much for health, blah, 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 so forth and so on. And then the next phase is accountability. Can they use the money that we authorize them to do? Or did they deviate? Did they follow what was authorized of them? Ito, iba nila ang plano. That is where the Commission on Audit comes in. Or what? Now, Unfortunately, because of our systems, which we have to change, in the COA rules, the COA accounting, the COA report comes one year and eight months after the amount has been spent. Nako, one year and eight months, who is interested in reading about something that happened almost two years ago? Only the students, according to Professor Riri, because they're mandated to by the professors. But others, legislators, 
By the time we get to get the papers, there are other issues before us. So that has to change. Now, citizens' participation started at the authorization level. In 2004, together with the Alternative Budget Institute, headed by Social Watch, and so many other special interest groups, were present during the hearings in Congress and persisted. At the start, you just are present. You talk to legislators so that they can air your views. But later on, due to persistence, due to tenacity, um, we were given, they were given, Social Watch was given, a committee hearing whereby they were given, they were given time to air their views in front of all the congressmen and even in the senators, in the Senate. Thanks to Senator DeLong, who was a senator then, and he is a senator now. But after Lloyd Roy came in, there is now an opening. We are also being heard in the preparation stage, which is very important. Why? It's so hard to change the budget whenever it's at the last part, the authorization. It's easier to change the budget before it is released in the preparation. So now we have NGOs who advocate on issues on health. Mercy is here. Mercy, what do you represent? What? Woman health. Woman health. Woman health. Woman health. Of the alternative budget. So, it's better when they make the budget of the Department of Health. It would be easier. Habang linuluto pa yung putahe, mas maganda, dagdaga mo na yung gusto mong gawin kaysa doon pa later on sa authorization. So now, we have, it's not perfect, it's only starting, we have citizens' participation through people's organization, through civil society organizations, participating in the preparation stage and the authorization stage of the budget. It's very important to understand the budget because there are so many ways that the executive, also known as the president and the department of budget, can deviate from what was budgeted. Also known as, dinuloko lang tayo. For example, if you think, let's put one billion in education for UP. You fight hard for it, you debate with the legislators and they finally they say, okay, okay, to UP makulit talaga. Let's add one billion to UP. So you say, ah, success. They added one billion in UP. Is that it? Oh, oh, oh. you know, there is in our laws, a practice that is allowed called impoundment. <laughs> impoundment. Who can impound? Yes. Everybody. The impoundment. It's called impounding because just like water, when you impound it, you don't release it, you hold it. And that's what happens. It's impounded. And I do remember, we had a series of uh, roundtable discussions here in UP. And I reported that according to the official DPM report, that 1.3 billion in 2006 was impounded for UP. UP that, that is overflowing with money? No. UP that obviously needs all the money, all the help 
the prime university of our republic, they impounded 1.3 billion. What does that mean? The money was never given to you. Oh. What happened? When we presented it to, I think, OICDP for Finance, Florendo, he said, and I quoted it because it was in a letter, we are shocked. We are shocked that we have savings of that amount. You see, the problem is, they don't say we impounded, no. They call it, manluloko talaga nung araw eh, they call it savings. <laughs> savings of UP, 1.3 billion. UP says, ha? Me? I have savings of 1.3? No! What happened? It doesn't mean you have savings with you. It means that the money was never released to you. That's what it means. Now, what is, what happens when it's saved? Why does the executive want to save or impound? Because once you impound, the money becomes savings. And once it becomes savings, you can use it for anything else. You can use it for anything else. And I love this example. In 2000, not sure about the year, I think it's 2008, we were lobbying for the release of an impounded item. This is under the Gloria administration. An impounded item in the budget. 400 million. Big small. Small. 400 million. M. Ha? In the boy. 400 million. For what? Tuberculosis. Anti-tuberculosis program. You know, which is one of the Millennium Development Goals. Huh? Millennium Development Goals and dreaded diseases. HIV, for you to get AIDS, you have to have contact. Remember, TB, you don't have to have contact. All you have to do is be in the same room with somebody, breathe in the same air with somebody who has TB. If somebody who has TB is here, he is happily spreading the germs and you are healing them right now. <laughs> okay, ba? Oh. And we now have three kinds of PB. First is the ordinary PB. Second is the drug-resistant PB. <laughs> Means you have to take extra doses of antibiotics to get cured. And we have ta -da -da -da. The third guy, the XTR, extremely drug resistant tuberculosis. What does that mean? If you get XTR PD, you just wait and lie there and die there. <laughs> because some amount of penicillin can cure you. And because of the underfunding of the government, we now have, ladies and gentlemen, XDRTV here in the Philippines. 400 million small amount for anti-tuberculosis. What did they do? Gloria, Makapagat Arroyo, impounded it, did not release it. We were not able to have it released. Obviously, they never released it. But in that same year, in that same year, they budgeted, authorized, and released 2 billion pesos for the purchase of two presidential helicopters. <laughs> Abuse of the powers of impounded. Maraming budget reforms ang kailangan. The other is the reenacted budget. What is a reenacted budget? It simply means that your budget last year becomes this year's budget. Okay? Now why do we have that? Well, you know, 
what happened in the United States, and I think it still happens, if the U.S. Congress does not pass the budget on December 31, government stops. It closes down. Why? Because we have the same law. Public money cannot be spent without an appropriation. And what's the appropriation of the budget? And in the passing budget, so there is no authorization. Therefore, government has to shut down. I remember one time the U.S. Embassy, I think Clinton and President Lyon, had to close for a few days because the budget was not passed. Here in the Philippines, we, the bright boys, pass an automatic reenactment provision so that if Congress, if Congress fails to pass the budget on time, if Congress fails to pass the budget on time, automatically last year's budget becomes this year's budget. Maganda sana. Good intentions. So that the government will not shut down and people can continue. And government and the country can continue running. Aha! Nakakita ng butas. For example, let's take the case of a bridge. Shall we say 500 million? In 2007, the bridge was appropriated and they built the bridge. They completed the bridge on time, on schedule, no problems. 100% fully completed. Let's say another passing bridge. Fine. 2008, na naman. For whatever reason, na And what happened? Because it was last year's budget, that appropriation for the bridge is still there. 500 million. Question. Will we construct the bridge again? It's fully completed. What happens to the 500 million? Savings. Oh, but savings are on. Used anywhere. Very happy, Madam President. She can use it for whatever, whichever, without your knowledge, without the knowledge of Congress. Ganon ang abuses. Reenacted budget. The Royal Administration was in power for nine years. And you know what? In all of those years, we have reenacted budgets. Huh? Reenacted budgets. And by the way, one of the years when we had a total, the whole year was a reenacted budget, was in the year of 2004. They failed to pass the budget. Last year's 2003 budget became 2004 budget. Huge savings for the Pinituan. Masaganang Ani program. 1.8 billion in savings was on February 2004. 1.8 billion was released in two days. This was requested February 2. It was released February 4. I don't know if you ever try to release money from the government, but you tell me who can release 1.8 billion pesos in two days because of the new savings. Anybody know your guess? Lara Gloria. His name was John John Pulante. 1.8 billion because of the reenactment budget. Requested February 2, released February 4. 90 days, 1.8 billion released 90 days before the 2004 presidential election between FPJ and Gloria. 
These are the two systems abuse. As we have learned from the Gloria administration, one empowerment goes down to savings, savings the president can use, can use anywhere. Two, reenacted budget becomes savings, savings goes to anywhere. I would like to mention though that in fairness to Gloria, these abuses apply to any president, even the present, present one, because the laws are still the same. So what is important is that we stop this problem of impoundment, we stop this problem of reenactment. But it's easier said than done. Karina Sililin showed you the eight bills I filed in Congress as an oppositionist to reform the budget. First and foremost was the anti-impoundment bill. But you know what? All my bills were the ones that were impounded. <laughs> Well, I invite them now as a senator and hopefully they will see the light of day. But you know, my friends, sometimes you know, you know how an elephant walks, no? Big, slowly, deliberate steps. Then suddenly you ask the elephant, can you please dance the twist? Very difficult for an elephant to learn how to dance the twist. But one day, one day, it will happen. So I can go on and on. I have so many other um, instances of systematic um, examples of abuse of the budget where the will of the people is thwarted. Mabuti pa United States. You know in United States, they had an anti-impoundment bill. They were able to pass it. So now, whenever the president wants to impound, he has to ask permission from Congress. Dito wala. Wala. So yun na those small examples, no, they're not small, they're, those examples of great, great abuse of the system, great abuse of the system, shows that we have to reform our budget laws. But there is no planner. Have you not seen in the TV a few days ago, Natarna, Minerder, Simul, Simulong yung katawan? How many of you talked about it? How many of you expressed horror? Because, because it's understandable. But when somebody writes in the column that 400 million was impounded, it's just as shocking. It's just as horrible. But if you don't understand it, if you don't understand it, it will have no relevance to you. It's very, very important that we have citizens' participation in the whole budget process and citizens' understanding. These few examples that I just gave you highlight how much work there is still, that still needs to be done before we have a truly people participative budget. And I can say that only when we have a truly meaningful participation by the people in our budget can we say that we have a true democracy. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you very much, Senator Ingona, for your rich insights.
and the exemplary, exemplary leadership that you have shown all these years. Now before we move on to our second reaction, we'd like to acknowledge the presence of the project manager of PNPE, Dr. Emmanuel Vendia. Now our last reactor for this lecture, she comes from the beautiful land of Mindanao, in the 2nd district of Lanao del Norte. She had also given a lecture during the Republico Youth Forum, which was about in December last year in the UB Film Institute. So let's all welcome Congresswoman Fatima Alia de Mapola. Let's give a warm round of applause. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I'm a football player. I've always been since zero to 11 years old, Baba. I've always played football. And every game until college, I would always still be nervous. No matter how many times a week we would practice, in every game I would always feel like my heart's racing. And that's how I feel every time I step up to a podium to speak. No matter how many times I've spoken in front of a number of people or hundreds of people, I always still get nervous. So, siguro, perhaps so that my nerves calm down, I'll start with an introduction of how I got to meet Professor Briannis. I first heard her name, I've been hearing her name a lot because I am a member of the committee, the special committee for the Millennium Development Goals. And then later in the year, later as uh, the time progressed in Congress, when we entered the budget season, I came across the document of alternative budget, a proposal, the alternative budget proposal, which was led by the question of VR. So I've seen her name and I've heard her name so many times. And I wonder who this woman is because with the wealth of publications she's had and the wealth of knowledge that she's imparted to a number of Filipinos on millennial development goals and also, of course, the budget process, I had wanted to meet her personally. And I was, of course, lucky to be on the same floor as one of her students, Marcus Paz. He was the one who introduced me to her budget and also guided me and introduced me to a number of other people who have helped me with the budget process or the budget season. I was told a number of times that it is very unusual for a first termer. If you don't know, it is my first term. Um, it's my first time to run in government position, although I have been exposed to government for a very long time. And I've also been involved in international policy when I worked in New York at the United Nations. But this is a very different level of politics. So I was very fortunate to have met Mark, one of the students of Professor Briannis, who then introduced me to her. And for that reason, I'm invited you today to meet everyone in this room. And I thank Professor Briannis to allow me to be sitting next to the great fiscalizer, Senator Vigona, and, and also in part perhaps my remarks on the alternative budget and um, citizens' participation. First, let's start with Millennium Development Goals. The MDGs is a huge issue now because we only have five years to actually attain it. And last year was, uh, there were a lot of support, a lot of support from other developed nations have come in to developing nations in order to speed up the process because we are going pretty slow in the MDGs. And here in the Philippines, we see that education and health, especially maternal health, has not been performing as well as other, uh, other commitments of the NDGs or other goals that we have committed to in the international community. The NDG is an international commitment, which is why it's important. But yet, that is my pressure. There is pressure from donor countries or from developed countries that get these funds in order to help the developing countries. If you don't know, there are eight goals in the NDGs, and one to seven is the commitment of developing nations. The eighth goal 
is the commitment of developed nations, wherein developed nations are committed to provide funding, which is a global partnership, to provide support, whether it's funding support or technical support, but whatever support they have due to their abundance of resources to developing nations, such as the Philippines. And so there is a lot of clamor, or there should be a lot of clamor, and a lot of monitoring from citizens like you to see where these funds are actually going to. Earlier, the question is, where is the money going to? And whether they are really addressing the problems that need to be addressed in accordance with our commitment to the Millennium Development Goals. So that's a huge thing. Why does this, this affect us? We think, I didn't understand how the international community and the United Nations affects the lives of Filipinos, just one person in our country, until I think if I was 20, I, I think I was 23 when I understood it. I understood it because I understood that international policy, when ratified by the countries that are members of a certain commission is made into national law. The clamor for MDGs is because it was given um, clamor or it was it was given importance in the international plane. Maternal health or the reproductive health right now the issue the main issue in Congress right now or a huge major issue in Congress currently is the reproductive health bill. And this is an issue that is being discussed in the international plane and has been discussed for a number of years. And so international policy does influence national policy. And this term of sustainability, we talk about long-haul advocacies, long-haul. We should be able to see things through sustainably and also see things through into the future. The concept of sustainability actually gained international recognition when during the Brundtland Commission in the 1980s. But in the 1980s, the Brundtland Commission focused much more on the subject on, of environment. After the subject on, on environment and the discussions for sustainable development, then came the question of whether public officials are actually doing their jobs. So then the concept of good governance became a huge issue. And under good governance comes in the issues of transparency, the issues of accountability, all these terms that you have heard in your courses, in your classes, the issues of equitability, and of course, finally, fiscal policy. Because it is my first term, it is also my first time to participate in the budget process. And in the budget process, I'm, I, my, my master's is in sustainable agriculture and rural development. So I have very little um, exposure to, to the budget process. Perhaps the, the most budgeting I know is really my own personal finances, which is not very different from actual finances. It's an allocation of what you prioritize in your own life what the country should prioritize in the lives of the people that they are to manage, or they are to govern, or they are to support. So when things get complicated, parang sinasabi, I always tell myself, go back to the basics. And the most basic thing is, how would you budget for yourself? If you're the president of the Philippines, if you're a government official, and you are therefore taking care of a household, how would you budget for that household, for your country? What would you prioritize? And of course, in thinking of this, we think towards the future. You know, I came for my own education. Since I went to an American school, and in my school, they instilled in us the concept that at 18, you are not supposed to be dependent on your parents anymore. So when I came, I went to college in Mindanao State University, and I was a scholar. I did not, I was not, I stopped becoming dependent on my parents when I was 18, only by the fact that I lived with my parents, so it was just the only thing, but I started to earn my own and um, started to pay for my own personal finances. And the only reason why I lived with my parents is because I am a Maranao, 
So in many ways, I am minority, and I'm also a Muslim woman, and I'm not allowed to live outside of my father's room until I get married. So these are these are just the, the circumstantial reasons why I am not fully independent, but in many ways, I have been independent since 18, and I know how to budget my own personal finances. And as simple as, con as a concept as this, I was able to quickly understand the budget process of the nation. But of course, I did not understand debt. You know, debt swapping, um, I, anything about debt, it was very confusing to me. So when I would deliberate in Congress, and I deliberated, I think it was eight, it was eight departments. I would study, literally study till three in the morning, Mark knows this. Three, literally studying till 3 in the morning what has happened in the years 2002 to 2009, what programs have been taken out. That in a chart, you will see that if you chart it out, and I, I like numbers and I like to be organized, if you chart it out, you will see that programs have been taken off if it's a zero in the, in the preceding years. And so I wanted to question these, question, question, and just ask, keep on asking questions, and ask how this has equitably benefited Mindanao. Because I am from Mindanao, I decided that the best way for me to participate in the budget process is to see if Mindanao, which houses or which is a home of many minorities of our country, is given an equitable share of our budget, of our public funds. And so that was the main gist of most of my interpretations. So throughout budget season, I had always conferred or referred to the alternative budget proposal of Professor Briones. And this was exactly something that I needed because I am not a believer of someone who, if I am opinionated, will only purely make noise. If I don't want a proposal, or if I question a certain policy, that would be an alternative, yeah. You can't just say, no, this is not a good policy because so and so. So you can give your reasons, but I think it is more effective as a fiscalizer and also as a public official and also as a citizen who should participate in the actual workings of our country to give an alternative. And this is why this is very important, or the alternative budget proposal was very important in my fiscalizing, my first experience of fiscalizing in Philippine Congress. Um, other things that, that I want to say is, or the last thing I want to say, or what would impart my closing remark, would be people power is very much alive. People power is very much alive because I come from the house of the people, and I represent my own people. In many ways, as I mentioned earlier, I am a minority. I am a woman. I am Muslim. I am from an indigenous tribe called the Maranao. And I also belong to the minorities in Congress. So in many ways, I am the minority. And in many ways, I deserve, there's more pressure for me to be the voice of those who I represent. But because of the wealth, we'll say wealth, of problems that the Philippines or that public officials, representatives of the Philippines, have to address in order to make lives better, it is impossible to do everything. And this is where we need people power. We can, we can be the least we can be. The least we can be is a voice. There are not so many people who have as much energy as I do where I can sleep only four hours and study all night and actually learn the budget. But there are people who want to speak up also and who do understand that there are problems with their system. And there are people in the House of Representatives who want to improve the system. This is a House of Representatives that's almost 50% new legislators. A House of Representatives that, 60, that has 64 women legislators, the largest in, in history, the largest population of women in history in, in Congress. And there are people in there who would like to have their hands the alternative budget and who would like to also listen to you in their offices. 
So I would like to end with just saying to continue with your people power and to continue to exercise your power because the, the, your power or the power truly belongs to you. We are just merely a voice. And also, earlier it was mentioned, I was, um, I was a guest for Republic of Filipino and somebody, a young person asked me, what can I as a young person do to participate in this country? And I, and I told him, the best way for you to participate is really to talk to your congressman or congresswoman, to talk to your legislator and air out your concerns. Because most of the time, we feel the same way, we think the same way. We're thinking there's something wrong with this. But there's just so many things wrong that we see in front of us, we don't know what to, to focus on. Unless or until someone comes up to us and says, this is a problem that needs to be addressed urgently. And they provide us with the material, and they teach us, and they, um, they, they give us all of the justifications that is needed in order to solidify our arguments. So we already see that something is a problem. But it is more empowering if it, it, it comes from the voice of the people, rather than just our own individual opinion or our own individual um, observation. So that's all I want to say. I, again, I thank everyone for, for inviting me here. It's, um, I, this is only my second time in, in UP to speak, and um, more power to the youth as well. Like um, Professor Diana said, we're here for a long haul, and three, three years in a term is really very short with, a, with the red tape that everyone has to go through. So I hope everyone is here for a long haul and to continue a good partnership between citizens, between the public, and between government. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Fatima Andrea Timaporo, for your heartfelt comments and for inspiring us and desire to work more closely with you on shared advocacy. Thank you. And now as we are about to start one of the highlights of this lecture, and that is your participation through our open forum, we'll be giving you enough time to write down your questions. The slips of paper will be distributed by our ushers, including your snacks, as we all witness the second set of our interrogation numbers. Okay, so let's um, go to a light loop again. Let's welcome our first intermission number in this set, and this is a song number with a song titled At Last. So let's all welcome a junior student from NCPAD, Ms. Ima Baji. Yeah. 